Okay, thank you. So it's uh, <clears throat> the third lecture. And I would like to start by summing up what happened during the first two lectures, maybe <clears throat> expanding it just a little bit. So I will mostly repeat what I said, but some of these things were appeared only when I answered questions or at the last moment of the lecture. So just a little bit, a little summary. Uh, oops. One second. Hmm. Sorry, the for some reason it doesn't react to the pencil. Oh, okay. And I will do the summary directly for uh and kdv so i was speaking about the kdv hierarchy all the time but now i expand to to nkdv so for every n greater than or equal to two there is the, what is called the gelfand dicke hierarchy so for n equals two you get the usual kdv usual kdv and so there are two approaches that i explained one uses lax pairs so you take the operator d to the n plus u n minus one of x d to the power n minus two i'm sorry for the shift but that's the the best way to do it plus and so on plus u one of x so there are n minus one functions so for n equals two there's for you the usual kdb there is only one function d is d over dx then you build the pseudo differential operator q such that q to the n is equal to l so the nth root of of l and this is a pseudo differential operator and you define the flows dl over dpk equals the commutator of the positive part of q to the power k with l and that gives you flows so commuting flows commuting flows on the space of n minus one tuples of functions so this is what is called nkdv and there are two remarks that are immediately deduced from that so the first remark is that the flows d over dpn d over d p2n and so on all multiples of n are equal to zero because uh in this case so q to the power n is just l and the commutator of l with l is, is zero the commutator of, of l squared with l is also zero so <clears throat> so the flows do not depend on these variables and uh well the second the second remark is that d over dp1 this is easy to this is easy to to check for every function ui of x this is just the derivative with respect to x and so the solution of to the flows the solution of this the, these equations has the form x plus so u of x plus p1 comma p2 p3 and so on and so we can remove we can remove x without using without losing any information if we wish so that was the summary of the first lecture with a summary with a with an expansion to from kdv to nkdv and uh, so the second approach is to start with any power series in variables pi 
So formal power series in P1, P2, P3, and so on. Decompose it into sure polynomials. So this is the sum over all partitions of all sizes, and these are sure polynomials. Oops. Then replace every sure polynomial with the vector V lambda. So this is in the semi-infinite wedge product of the space of Laurent series in Z. And V lambda is Z to the power one minus lambda one, which Z to the power two minus lambda two, which and so on. And uh, so uh, this element is decomposable. So this is equal to phi one, phi one wedge of Z, wedge phi two of Z, wedge and so on. If and only if, if and only if tau is a solution is a solution of the Hirota hierarchy and this is also equivalent to f so the logarithm of tau being the solution of the kp hierarchy And uh, so if F is a solution of KP, solution of KP, and F does not depend on PN, P2N, P3N, and so on, if we are lucky and we see that uh, our solution does not depend on variables, uh, with indices that are multiples of n, that implies that uh, so that that gives us a solution of nkdv, and actually, so we should denote ui is d two f over dp one dpi, and this is a solution a solution of nkdv. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, can you go just one page before? Yes. So we are using sure polynomials. My question is what's happening if we are using other family of orthogonal polynomials, for example, zonal polynomials or some other kind of polynomials, let's say. So I do not know if anything like that can work. I mean, the proof of the proof of this, so you, you see there is actually a, there is actually a very strong theorem that uh, this equivalence is actually a very surprising fact because uh, so here you have Pluca relations to get to, 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 to determine if a vector is decomposable or not. The fact that Pluca relations combine into partial differential equations, so this Hirota hierarchy is a, is a hierarchy of PDEs. This actually heavily relies on the representation theory on, on the properties of short polynomials. So I did not look at the proof with the idea of replacing them by something else, but I doubt that it is possible. It is really, a, I mean, I have the feeling that it really, it, it is really very important that you use, you really use the representation theory of the symmetric group heavily in the proof. Uh, okay, well, uh, just one second. No, because in zonal polynomials, there is also some, representation theory so maybe there is something behind yeah, yeah. It. I, I don't know i understand yes yeah. so it's a so i so I, I i cannot promise maybe there is something maybe, maybe there is something to to find here i i did not really try to to look for the precise conditions for this to work but i'm sure that the conditions are pretty strong so maybe i, I agree zonal polyno polynomials are close enough to short polynomials so maybe so something like that could work i don't know okay thank you Okay, so I just wanted to raise 
that i is between one and n minus one. So this gives us the solution. This gives us a solution of of NKDV. And uh, finally, one last thing. Uh, what is the condition? So, okay, we have we have a, we have a solution of KP. We know how to construct solutions of KP. Uh, we start. We just start with any any power series phi phi one of z, phi two of z, and so on. And we construct their wedge phi one, phi two, phi three, and uh, that gives us a solution of KP. So, what is the condition? If we want the solution not to depend on Pn, P2n, P3n, what is the condition of on phi1, phi2, phi3? So the condition is that um, the condition is that the span of these power series, three and so on. So the span of these in E in the space in the space of Laurent polynomials. I will write it like that: Laurent series is invariant under multiplication multiplication by z to the n so you take n if you want phi 2 phi 3 to get a solution of kp if you want a solution of nkdv you take them in such a way that their span is the invariant of so if you if you multiply any phi i by z, z to the power n you get a linear combination of phi i's okay and this so this second approach uh, maybe does not lead to equations as easily as the first it, it, it actually it also allows you to compute equations so it it, it allows you to compute the equations but best of it's most of all it allows you to construct solutions very easily so i don't know if you if you look at examples of uh, uh, papers where people prove that such a function is a solution of kdv so there is for example uh, witten's conjecture that some um, generating series for intersection numbers on the moduli spaces is a solution of uh, of kdv and conservatives proof and so how do you think he proves that something is a solution of KDV. Does he check the Does he check the actual equations like the you know, this, the, the first equation that I wrote, right? Du du over dt one equals u du over dt zero plus one twelve d three u <coughs> dt zero cubed. So that's the first equation. So you could check the first equation. There are there's an infinite number of equations to check so actually he does not check the equations instead he finds power series phi1 phi2 phi3 in this case they are um, asymptotic expansions of the airy function at infinity and of its derivatives and the airy function satisfies so the airy function is a special function that is a solution of an order two differential equation so the asymptotic expansions of its derivatives. Uh, so if you if you differentiate it twice, actually the asymptotic expansion can be ex can be expressed from from the first two, and this is what gets you this is what gets you this uh, this property that the the space spanned by these asymptotic expansions is invariant by multiplication by z, by z squared, and he proves that that if you do this construction and uh, construct the power series f this is the generating series for intersection numbers on the moduli space so instead of checking the equation he finds the power series phi1 phi2 phi3 similarly if you look at how so there is a theorem that the uh, generating series for hurwitz numbers is a solution of the kp hierarchy this time this kp so there is no <coughs> no uh, no condition of the, so it depends on all variables p1 p2 p3 and again how do you prove that <laughs> you actually construct explicit power series p1 p2 p3 and prove that if you do this construction you find the the generating series for for Hurwitz numbers so this is the approach that allows you to construct solutions of of the kdv hierarchy or other hierarchies easily 
without even knowing what the equations are. You don't need to know if you forgot how to write the equations, it doesn't matter. But also there is a general way to write any solution through uh, tau function, which in turn can be written through baker hazer function. So you make some assumption about a uh, certain number of poles of this baker hazer function and it fix, uh, then it transforms in a certain multi soliton solution of this KDVs. Yeah, so all solutions of at least ordinary KDV, I don't know about generalizations, as they can be written in such a way. So this is so this is the this is the creature's approach, right? Mm, yeah. Probably some yes, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, so it is so it is included, yeah. So it is a uh, yeah, so it is it is this so it's uh, it's the same actually. So you 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 construct you construct the tau function. Yeah, tau right? function, but but in, in other way, so without this factorization. Actually, here I wanted to ask a question. So, yeah. uh, about it, can you comment uh, somehow on integrable structure in this second picture? So, in the first picture, so one can generate uh, densities of integrals of motions taking residues of powers of L of that uh, pseudo differential operator. Yes, yeah, then, then one can define Poisson bracket, check that there is an involution of all this big story. Yes. So, in here, you tell us about this factorization property in, in, and uh, we ask a question. So all this structure, do they have some nice uh, uh, interpretation in this uh, Grassmannian language? The, you mean the, this, the, the, the Poisson structure, the, the Hamiltonians, right? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. For example, integrals of motions, yeah, Hamiltonians and uh, involution of those. So let me think for a moment. That's a, that's an interest. That's a, a good question, of course. Maybe, maybe, yeah, one, one second. Mm. So, yeah. So in some in some sense, what I'm going to tell now is a, is a kind of an answer mm. that is not. So maybe maybe let 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 <clears throat> can, let let's discuss that in the in the end. I think it will be so. There will be some more some mm -hmm. more preparation. So okay, okay, okay. okay. So in yeah. So in 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 some sense, it is related to uh to the formal Fourier series for the function u but okay you will see you will see it will appear so it will not not even today it will appear then it will appear tomorrow oh well here you you you, you uh, here there is also kind of a non-local aspect of the story because so if, for example if you from the differential operators you can construct densities of integrals of motions right mm -hmm. but integrals of motion it is integral of density over over x yeah yeah so it's also there is some aspects of this uh, taking of integral <laughs> over x okay okay so so now we're starting the yet another way so yet another way to construct to construct yet another way to construct construct kdv uh, that will use so that will use using intersection theory theory on the moduli space of curves. So I would like to uh, motivate it a little bit because it's uh, it seems like a very roundabout way to construct KDV. After all, there are already many constructions. Why do we need one more? So there are several advantages. First of all, it is a theory that constructs many uh, integrable hierarchies integrable hierarchies in a uniform way uh, 
in a uniform way. So to some degree, this was already the case with the, with the approach with the lux pairs that allowed to construct all NKDV hierarchies at the same time. And the second approach that constructed KP and all NKDVs at the same time. But this allows, to, allows you to construct even more. So it is a much more general, much more general construction. Uh, okay, so the second thing is that it comes, so every, every hierarchy, every hierarchy, hierarchy comes with its quantization. And this is really a very, very serious advantage because very little is known about quantizations of integrable hierarchies. So as we have just discussed, uh, there is a Hamiltonian formulation of KDV. So you can view KDV as Hamil Hamiltonian flows. So it is natural to ask what a, if, so as Hamiltonian flows on an infinite dimensional Poisson manifold. So it is natural to ask, can you quantize this infinite dimensional Poisson manifolds? Can you quantize the flows? So for KDV, there was a construction, but for many other hierarchies, it was completely open. And here there is a theory that does it again in a uniform way for a huge amount of different hierarchies and more or less for free. You don't need to modify anything in the construction. It's just every hierarchy comes with a, with a quantum version naturally. So then there is, um, um, let's say it's a con conjecture. Well, yeah, so th there, there's a statement and a conjecture. So every, every hierarchy appears uh, in standard, standard coordinates, standard variables, maybe better, standard variables. So there is one thing about integrable hierarchies that you can easily uh, disguise them. If you have KDV, so KDV depends on this infinite number of variables, P1, P2, well, T, T, T0, T1, T2, T3, and so on. But then you can do a change of variables, introduce new variables that are expressed in some way from these T0, T1, T2, T3, and you get another integrable hierarchy that is actually equivalent to KDV, but that is written in a different way. So in this construction that uses, that uses moduli spaces, you have some minimality property. So there is a range of degrees that the Hamiltonians cover that is the smallest possible. So there is an actual, there is a theorem that any change of variables increases the, the range of degrees covered by the Hamiltonian. So you know that every hierarchy that appears in this construction appears in a kind of standard, standard way. And there's, uh, uh, there are many conjectures related to usual hierarchies, prove that you can bring them to this minimal way and check that they actually, so that they actually coincide with this, coincide with this construction. So actually, even, even for NKDV, it is not known. For KDV, it is done, but for NKDV, if I'm not mistaken, it is still an open question. So this is the last advantage as a active research area. research area. So if you learn the content of the first two lectures, you will know two approaches to KDV, but here you will dive right into, into, into open questions and you will be able to contribute. Okay. So now I have to, now I will do my standard introduction to moduli spaces. Yeah, I, I don't know how much of it is needed actually. I don't know what is the, don't know how much the audience knows already. Yeah, I guess I will. I guess I will do it anyway. And a question. Worth, yeah, there's a question. Uh, what, did, what did you mean by change of variables? Did you mean uh, so-called Miura transformations. Miura transformations, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is uh, 
applicable to Hamiltonian hierarchies only. Yes, so all so all these hierarchies are Hamiltonian, yes. Mm -hmm. So I think I will I will probably not tell yeah, I will probably not not explain about not, <clears throat> not tell you about this Poisson structure, but all the hierarchies in this construction are Hamiltonian. Okay, so we will need to compute uh, intersection numbers on moduli space of stable curves. So let me start with the notation MGN. This is the space of genus G, so smooth, smooth genus G complex curves. curves with n pairwise distance distance numbered marked points So the first examples, yeah, and up to up to isomorphism. So the first examples are M03, that is just a point. Yeah, so maybe I should also, maybe I should write 2G minus two. Oops. The Euler characteristic of the curve with N punctures, punctures should be negative. Otherwise there is no moduli space. So for genus zero, we have to have at least three marked points. And then the moduli space is just the point because any, any genus zero curve with three marked points, x1, x2, x3, is isomorphic to CP1, the complex projective line. And you can always bring the three marked points to zero, one, and infinity in a unique way. There's a unique automorphism of CP1 that brings any three given points to zero, one, and infinity. M04, so same thing. We start with, we start with a genus zero curve with four marked points and the genus zero curve is always isomorphic to CP1. And we can always bring the three first points to zero, one, and infinity. And then the fourth marked point will go to some lambda. So this is the cross ratio of x1, x2, x3, and x4. Uh, let me try to write this properly. x4 minus x1, x2 minus x1, divided by x4 minus x3, x2 minus x3. And so lambda is different from zero, one, and one and infinity because I said that the unmarked points are pairwise distinct. So this is CP1 minus three points, zero, one, and infinity. And M11 is the upper half plane factored by SL2Z. So if you take a point tau, I'm sorry, this is not at all the same tau as in the tau function, it's just a complex number with positive imaginary parts. Then the corresponding elliptic curve is C over Z plus tau Z. So you have a lattice generated by one and tau. You factor C by this lattice and the image of the lattice itself is the marked point. So you get an elliptic curve, a genus one curve with one marked point.
Okay. And uh, yeah, and so the so this this quotient maybe I can draw this quotient. So there is a there is a fundamental domain for the group action of SL two Z. So this quotient is. is this modular figure with the left hand side identified with the right hand side and this arc identified with this arc. So M11 is homeomorphic to a sphere with one puncture. And there are two special points where the automorphism group of the elliptic curve is larger larger than usual. Okay, so then as you can see in these examples, MGN is in general not compact. So M03 is compact, but M04 is not, M11 is not, and we would like to compactify them. It is always easier to do intersection theory on compact varieties. So MGN bar is the moduli space of stable curves of genus G with n marked points. So let me draw a stable curve. A stable curve has only one kind of singularities, which are simple self-intersections. So some people draw them like that, like in X times Y equals zero, that's a simple self-intersection. But since they are complex curves and I like to draw, the, draw them as surfaces, I draw them this way. So here they appear to be tangent, but this is an illusion actually, it is a simple self-intersection transversal self-intersection, there is no tangency. And then there can be components that self-intersect also. So this could be a, a curve like that, and then there are some marked points. So the, so first of all, the marked points are smooth. So our marked point cannot go to the nodes. This is a these. So this curve has four four nodes, and marked points cannot coincide with nodes. So as I said, the only possible singularities are simple self intersections, and also there is the condition that the number of automorphisms of the curve is finite. So if you have a component of genus zero, it must have at least three special points. Like here, there are two marked points and one node. And if we have a genus one component, there must be at least one special point. So now there is a, sorry, there are five nodes actually. I missed one, there's this curve has five nodes. So now the test question, what is the, what is the genus of this curve? If you are very brave, you can answer. You can switch on the mic and answer. Otherwise you can type in the chat. No answers. What is the what is the genus of this curve? Five. Let's see. I should count one, two, three, four, five. Yes. So. So if I take this, if I take this, uh, if I take this curve and uh, smooth it, smooth it out, and maybe I will do it on this picture. So first of all, you, you already see three handles, like one, two, three on the picture, but there are, there, are the, there are other handles that will appear if I smooth out all the nodes. So let me do it on this picture. I erase the neighborhood of every node and I draw a smooth curve that is close to this singular curve in the moduli space of curves. It would be something like that. And you see there are two more handles that appeared from the from the <clears throat> cycles of the well 
cycles of the graph formed by the by the irreducible components. Okay. So over over the moduli space there are so I need to introduce uh, n line bundles and one vector bundle. So let me draw. This is MGN bar. So maybe I will even draw the my usual picture. So over every point here, I have a, a curve. Most of the time it's a smooth curve. But then there are some special points that I added during the compactification where where the curve acquires a node so here also it has a node And this is another type of node. So the first one, the first example, what with non-separating nodes, but here you have separating nodes that splits the curve into two components. And so on. And then there are even deeper strata where the curve has two nodes. Like, yeah. Something like that. Okay, so the so first let me introduce the line bundles. So let me take one of the marked points, for example, the first mark marked point. So I will number it. I said that the points were num the marked points were numbered. So let's take the first marked points. And the tradition is to take the cotangent line. I'm drawing it as a tangent line. You could also take the tangent line, but usually one takes the cotangent line to the to the curve at the first marked points. So this is a complex line. Oops. So as you see over every, yeah, and so just one remark, this line is always well-defined because the marked points are always smooth. As I said, in stable curves, marked points cannot, uh, cannot coincide with nodes. So this is a perfectly well-defined line for, every, for every, every stable curve. So as you see now on over each point of MGN bar, there's a red line. So these lines form a line bundle that is called L1. And they can also take the same line bundle for the second mark point and so on. So there are N line bundles for every marked point. There is the corresponding cotangent line bundle. And there is a standard notation for their first term classes. So psi i is the first term class of Li. And it's it lies in H2 of MGN bar. No. So I realized, sorry, I realized I skipped, I skipped the examples of MGN bar. I wanted to give you examples of compactification. So maybe I'll I'll go back for a moment, and then we'll come back to the to the to the <clears throat> to the bundle. So let me so let me give the same the same three examples of compactified moduli spaces. So M zero three was a point, and this is already compact. So there is no change. This is equal to M zero three, and this is equal to one point. This is just one point. M03 is already compact, there is, so the compactification does not change anything. 
So M04 was CP1 punctured at three points. So M04 bar is going to be CP1. But there are three special points. So it is interesting what happens at these three special points. If we take just any point, just any point lambda here, lambda, well, this corresponds to a smooth curve with markings 0, 1, infinity, and lambda. As I said, the right, the the point of the mod, the point lambda of the moduli space encodes the the smooth curve with three marked points zero one infinity and lambda. But what is interesting is what happens if I take the point here. So lambda tends to zero. And here actually we get the stable curve like that. So marked points are not allowed to coincide. So instead there is a bubble that appears, the curve decomposes into two, two components. And so we have, uh, yeah, x1, x4, x3, x2, x3, x2, x3 on one component and x1, x4 on the other. And there are three ways to split x1, x2, x3, and x4 into two pairs. And these three ways correspond to the three points that we added under the compactification and to the three non-smooth stable curves. So these are the, the three points that we add, add under the compactification and they correspond to these three stable curves. And M11 bar, well, it is a it is M11 union one point. So there is just one extra point that corresponds to the genus one stable curve like that. So here is a genus one curve with one marked point, and it is uh, so it is not not smooth. It is a singular singular stable curve. That's the only one. Okay, so so these are the spaces where we're going to work with. And uh, okay, so I go back to uh, hmm. So, okay, so I go back to my line bundles. I just wanted to add one warning. So we have N line bundles over MGN bar. We have their first turn classes. And um, if these moduli spaces were smooth varieties, the first turn classes would be integers. But these are actually Deling Mumford stacks or orbifolds. Orbifolds or Dilling Mumford sex. And so churn classes of vector bundles actually can be can have uh, can take rational values. So for instance, if we take this example M11, so remember M11 was obtained by gluing the opposite sides of the modular figure. So if you glue it together, you get something like this. An infinite bag. And then under the compactification, we add one point and it becomes homeomorphic, homeomorphic to the sphere. So we could ask, what is the integral over M11 bar of the class Psi1? So Psi1 is the first turn class of lines cotangent to the 
unique, unique marked point of the curve. So over every point, right, over every point here, you have a curve. This curve has a marked point. We take the tangent line to this cotangent line to this marked point, and we get a line bundle over M11 bar. And we would like to find the first term class of this line bundle. And the answer, rather surprisingly, is 1 over 24. So I think I'm not going to, to show it now. There is a way to show it using modular forms. But um, yeah, but uh, just to warn you that you don't necessarily get integer, integer answers. Okay. Um, so the Hodge bundle, I need one more. So maybe, maybe let's, so let me, okay. The Hodge bundle. So the Hodge bundle is a, um, let me denote it by E for instance. So it is, um, rank G vector bundle over MGN bar. And uh, okay, so if I take a point in MGN bar, I have the corresponding stable curve CP. And I have the corresponding line, so fiber of this line bundle EP that corresponds to that. So EP is the space of holomorphic holomorphic one forms on CP. Right, so Every point in the moduli space corresponds to a curve. On this curve, we have holomorphic one forms. And it is known, it is well known that on the, on the genus G smooth Riemann surfaces, the space of holomorphic one forms has dimension G. So you get a rank G vector bundle. And the only question is how do you expand it? How, how do you, sorry, how, to, how do you extend the definition to stable curves? So I will actually spend several minutes describing it because it's kind of, it's kind of plays of an it plays an important role in the in the construction. So extending. So what is a okay? What is a holomorphic holomorphic one form? on a stable curve. If the curve is not smooth. So for instance, let's look at the example of elliptic curves. So here is an elliptic curve. There is, so it is obtained from <clears throat> from the <clears throat> complex plane by factoring quotienting by a lattice of parallelograms. So a holomorphic one form here is just a constant times dz. And this is a holomorphic one form that descends on the descends on the uh, on the elliptic curve because it is periodic. dz here and dz here is the same. And it has two periods. So if I integrate this holomorphic one form along a cycle like that or like that, I will get two complex numbers that you can see here. Right, so now suppose that we're going to the boundary of the moduli space. The boundary, yeah, so, so we're, so our, our elliptic curves, curve becomes singular. So it transforms into a stable curve and it acquires a node. So the thing is we could still have, we could still have a, a, a non-zero integral of the form 
uh, on this cycle. So how do we get a non-trivial integral on a cycle like that? Well, we actually have to have a pole at this point. So now we have a sphere with two points that get glued together. So let's say zero and infinity. And here we get point C times dz over z. Maybe I should write over two pi i. I don't know, it doesn't matter. So constant times, constant times dz over z. So this constant is the integral, so up to a factor of two pi i is the integral of the form along this cycle. And it is the, well, it is determined by it. Well, it's, it's the, the limit of what the integral was <clears throat> before, before the curve collapsed, before the cycle collapsed. So the definition, let me give a proper definition, definition. A holomorphic, holomorphic one form. Maybe I should <clears throat> take holomorphic now in quotes, quotes is allowed to have at most simple poles, simple poles at the nodes, at the nodes. So a holomorphic one form on a stable curve, on a stable curve. At most simple poles at the nodes with opposite residues. So if I take, I think my picture of a, okay, I have to draw this picture again because I spoiled it by smoothing out the curve. So if I, if I take a picture like that, so this is my stable curve. Right. So a holomorphic one form, well, it would be, so it, it's a one form on each irreducible component. One form here, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, alpha four. So there are four different one forms. And these forms do not have to be holomorphic. They're allowed to have simple poles at, at the nodes. And the only condition is that the residue of the pole, so the residue of the pole of alpha one on this side of the node should be the opposite to the residue of the pole of alpha two at this side of the node. And this condition comes from the fact that I want to, if I disingularize the, if I smooth out the node, I want to be able to glue alpha one and alpha two together into a unique one form. And then the residue of the node will actually be the, the integral over this loop. And so the integral over these two loops should be the same because if I smooth out the node, <clears throat> the, two lob, the two loops become homologous to each other. So the, the integral should be the same. So this is just, this is a definition and the a proposition is that with this definition, the space of holomorphic one forms, one forms has dimension G for any, for any stable curve of genus G. So it is a good definition because in this way, for any stable curve of genus G, we have a G-dimensional space of holomorphic one forms. And moreover, they actually form a rank G vector bundle over MGN bar. And this is called the Hodge bundle. Okay, so, um, so I have yeah, like two or three minutes left. So I think I will not define DR cycles today. But I will still do I, I will still do one thing with this with this with the Hodge bundle. So let's take the Hodge bundle. So let's look at MGN bar. MGN bar. 
So here we have our Hodge bundle over every point. We have our, the rank G, well, the dimension G space, this is the Hodge bundle E. And I would like to restrict the Hodge bundle to, uh, so this, you see inside, inside MG and bar, I can take the locus of curves where the curve splits into a component of genus G1 and a component of genus G2. And there's another locus where the curve acquires a non-separating node. So actually there are two maps from MG1 you know what, let's, let's just forget about the marked points because they don't play any role for the Hodge bundle. So let's just, let's just do, let's just suppose that there are no marked points. So then there is a map from MG1, sorry, MG1 with one marked point times MG2 with one marked point to MG0, so MG bar, so <clears throat> no marked points. What is this map? You just take, you just take, as this picture shows, you just take a, a, a stable curve of genus G1 with one marked point here, take a stable curve of genus G2 with one marked point and you glue them together. And there's another map from MG minus one, two bar to MG bar. And this is this picture, so you take you take a stable curve of genus G minus one with two marked points and you glue, glue these two marked points together and you get a stable map from uh, a stable map of, uh, of genus G, a stable curve, sorry, a stable curve of genus G. So let's call these maps Q and S. And I would like to understand the pullbacks of the Hodge bundle under these two maps. So here's the claim. I claim that for the map Q, it's actually very simple. For the map Q, this is actually, so if I take the pullback of the Hodge bundle of genus G, I just get the Hodge bundle of genus G1 that corresponds to genus G1 plus, this is a direct sum, the Hodge bundle for genus G2. Indeed, this is very easy to prove. So let's look what is a, what is a holomorphic one form on a curve like that. So as I said, you take a one form alpha on the left and one form beta on the right. They are allowed. They are allowed to have simple poles at the node. But a holomorphic well, but a one form cannot have just one pole, because the sum of residues of alpha is equal to zero. So alpha is, is allowed to have a simple pole at, this, at the node, but since there is only one pole, it, can, it cannot have just one node. So actually it is allowed to have, the, the, to have a pole, but it can't. So alpha is just a holomorphic one form. And similarly, beta is also just a holomorphic one form. So you see this is dimension G, EG is of dimension G, this is of dimension G1, this is dimension G2. And it works perfectly fine. G1 plus G2 is equal to G. So the Hodge bundle restricted to this, to curves with a separating node is just a direct sum of two Hodge bundles. So for a non-separating node, it's a little bit more subtle. For the non-separating node, we have the following. We have actually an exact sequence, E G minus one, that maps to EG and that maps to C, the trivial line bundle. So you see if you, so what is a, what is a holomorphic one form on a stable curve like that? It is a form that is allowed to have two simple poles with opposite residues. And this time this actually can happen because well, indeed uh, uh, F2 form can have two, 
two poles, and in this case, two residues are indeed opposites. So inside this space, there's a space of holomorphic one forms that have no poles at the node. Then there is, so this has dimension G minus one. Then there is this space that has dimension G where you allow simple poles at the, at the, two, at the two, two branches of the node. And this map is the residue at one of the points, let's say at the, the first, at the first of the two points that you glue together. So you take the residue and you just get a complex number. So in this case, <clears throat> the relationship between, so since we go from genus G to genus G minus one, it is not possible that EG is equal to EG minus one. Instead, one is inside the other and the factor is a trivial vector, a trivial line bundle. So they are still pretty close. Okay, so I stop here, thank you. And we'll go from this to integrable hierarchies next time. <clears throat>